Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Shakespeare's Henry VI, Part 1, one of his mm, lesser studied history plays. Shakespeare has two big history cycles which explore a series of kings. I would say it's the first one in the cycle, but a lot of scholarship seems to think that this one was written after Henry VI, Part 2 and 3, as a prequel. And although it references a whole lot of stuff that was in some of Shakespeare's later history plays, the heroism of Henry V, the sins, perhaps, of Henry IV, all the complicated lineage stuff that comes from the forced abdication of Richard II, all that stuff is in the background, but is really just history at this point. It hasn't been written out in Shakespeare's plays yet. Sometimes Shakespeare's histories are a little bit hard to wrap our heads around because there are so many characters, he is playing with history, he's expecting a certain knowledge base from his audience, and some of that is more than the scope of what I have time to do right here. So instead of explaining all the lineage problems, I recommend, one, that you read all of his history plays, you'll get a bigger picture of it all. And two, don't fret too much, just try to get the big details. So my goal today is simply to hit the highlights of the action from Act 1 to Act 5, and also explore some of the big things that make this play kind of special and cool. There's been a lot of question in scholarship whether Shakespeare wrote the whole thing, or collaborated a little bit, or collaborated a whole lot, and maybe only wrote like a fifth of it. There's a couple of scenes where scholars are like, Shakespeare definitely wrote this one, we're not sure about the rest. And part of that is that this is early Shakespeare, and so it could be that he's just trying out his voice, or it could be that he's co-writing it with a whole bunch of friends. In any case, they always give Shakespeare the best bits. This is also staged in the middle of a continuous conflict with France. If you look back at Henry V, Henry V wins over France and claims France for England. And this is, to some extent, the story of how France is lost again. And one of the key characters in that conflict is Joan of Arc. And Shakespeare's treatment of Joan of Arc is really interesting. When we look back at Joan of Arc, we usually think of her as a saint, and we think of her heroism and power. But Shakespeare's the other side of that coin. He is looking at her as the villain. And although she seems to be a rich, complicated character at the beginning, she sort of deteriorates as the play goes on. Something that I want to note. She's certainly not a hero here. This play explores complicated conflict in the middle of history, and like I said, there are many characters, many events, lots of things unfolding here. Unlike some of the tragedies or comedies, we can't see that clear plot arc quite as crisply, perhaps. Sometimes it helps to try to get a big perspective of this play in order to be able to unpack it all. What is this play about? If I were to say it's about any one thing, I would say it's about the death of heroism and the slow deterioration of power because of infighting. We have a couple of characters that represent the old school heroes. The play opens at the funeral of Henry V, who is one of England's great, great heroes. And as he's lying there, all of the royals and the family and the upper class are gathered around and looking at him and saying, there was a hero. And it's interesting that they're all gathered around him because in just a few minutes, they're all going to be fighting with each other. But for now, they come together to recognize the end of this great hero. And in that same moment, we get all these messages about how France is rising back up and beginning to take back over. It's bad, bad news. And as Henry V is dead there, it's as though the heroism of England has begun to die. It's not dead yet, though, because we have a couple of really great heroes still guiding and leading England on. Those heroes are mostly Talbot, who is this great, powerful warrior and terror to the French, and also Salisbury. The new powers of England, though, are all squabbling and weak and self-interested. There's no sacrifice of themselves for Mother England. Instead, they're constantly manipulating the situation in their own personal interest. So let's look at how this unfolds. Act 1 begins, as I said, with the death of Henry V. All of the nobles are gathered around. They hear that they have lost several cities in France because Charles the Dauphin is rising up and trying to take over. 
the biggest loss is the capture of Talbot, the great hero. But he's not dead yet. The play quickly cuts to what Charles the Dauphin is doing as he is beginning to rise in power and recover what was taken by Henry V. He is introduced to a young shepherd girl named Joan. Although he tries to play a trick on her to test the, her word that she is holy and special, she immediately recognizes him and then fights him and beats him. Dauphin, she says, I am by birth a shepherd's daughter, my wit untrained in any kind of art. Heaven and Our Lady gracious hath it pleased to shine on my contemptible estate. Lo, whilst I waited on my tender lambs, and two sons parching heat displayed my cheeks, God's mother deigned to appear to me, and in a vision full of majesty willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country from calamity. Her aid she promised and assured success. In complete glory she revealed herself. And whereas I was black and swart before, with those clear rays which she infused on me, that beauty I am blessed with, which you may see. Ask me what question thou canst possible, and I will answer unpremeditated. My courage try in combat, if thou darest, and thou shalt find that I exceed my sex. Resolve on this, thou shalt be fortunate if thou receive me for thy warlike mate. And so she seems to be this holy maid who is shining with power from heaven and able to fight and able to outwit and able to do all this stuff. And Charles is very impressed with her and immediately won over, not only because of her holiness and her prowess, but also because she's pretty attractive. In some ways throughout the play, although Joan is supposed to be this holy figure, she's constantly associated with this sort of sexual tension. In some ways, it's a way of humanizing or drawing her back down. More on that as we get towards the end. We return to England and find that Gloucester, who is supposed to be the regent taking care of the little baby Henry VI, and the Bishop of Winchester are squabbling. They are trying to bother each other, attack each other, get in each other's way as much as possible. Instead of being unified against the problems of the day, they're just squabbling. Act one ends as we jump to Orléans, where Talbot has been ransomed by Salisbury. And so our two last great heroes of the day are back together again, and we're ready to fight the French. Unfortunately, one little gunner boy runs out and, with a lucky shot, takes out Salisbury. Meanwhile, Joan, surprise attack, comes in and overtakes Orléans. And here's Talbot, who's just come from being a prisoner of war, and he's looking around and everything is falling apart around him. But he vows to stand up and continue to fight for England. And so Act Two begins in Orléans. And now that Joan and Charles have taken Orléans, Talbot and his, the other leaders, Burgundy and Bedford, come and overtake Orléans. And the French army is a mess, and Talbot drives them all away in fear. Even his name seems so potent that it terrifies the French. And one English soldier doesn't even pull out his weapon, he just shouts, Talbot, Talbot! And everybody runs away from him. One of the local ladies, the Countess of Auvergne, invites Talbot over to her house. She wants to see this great English hero. And it turns out that this is actually a trap because she tries to invite him in and then lock him in and keep him prisoner so that she can gain glory for the French. But although she looks him up and down and sees, ah, you're no Hercules, you don't look like anything for this great terror of the French. It's not Talbot's muscle that's the terror. He calls and immediately his soldiers jump in and rescue him. And he goes on to say that my true strength is here, the British army. It's this army of English. Unified England is a powerful thing. Which is a really important point here at the beginning of the play, because we're going to see as the play goes on, England's going to lose that powerful unification. In fact, we jump back to England where Richard Plantagenet is having an argument with Somerset. Now, Richard Plantagenet is really important. He was a descendant of the line that should have been king way on back. But there was that whole thing where Richard II was pushed off the throne and Henry IV stepped up, and his family name is complicated. He's lost his family titles because his father was part of a rebellion that attempted to readjust those lines and overthrow Henry V. That rebellion is recorded early in Henry V, if you go back and read that play. But his father's buddies were all imprisoned or killed, and now Richard is without estate. 
in that way, he's problematic because he's kind of a threat to the throne, but in his current state, he's not a threat to the throne. And he's having just an argument generally with Somerset, and Somerset brings up his ignoble lineage because of the traitor that his father was. And as the two of them are arguing, they pluck roses and pin them to their shirts as a matter of voting who's right. All of Richard Plantagenet's friends pick the white roses and pin them to their shirts, and all of Somerset's friends pick the red roses and pin them to their shirts. Foreshadowing? Yes! This is the precursor to the War of the Roses, which is going to be explored in the next several plays. This is also the scene that people think is most clearly Shakespeare, and the language is fantastic. The clever wordplay as they go back and forth in this argument is wonderful. In any case, Richard Plantagenet is angry and goes back and investigates his line a little bit more clearly. And he vows to restore his family land and his title, and maybe even more. Act 3, we finally meet Henry VI. He hasn't even shown up until now. I mean, isn't this play supposed to be about him? But he's basically a little kid, and he's not capable of really accomplishing anything yet. In fact, the majority of what he does in this play is go, Can't we get along, guys? Please! We're in Parliament. The king is supposed to be involved. But instead of getting anything done, we have constant fighting between Gloucester, the regent who's supposed to be helping Henry rule, and Winchester, the rotten Catholic bishop who is all greedy and evil. And not only do we have these two constantly fighting, but we also have the tension between Somerset and Richard Plantagenet. Henry says, Uncles of Gloucester and of Winchester, the special watchmen of our English wheel, I would prevail if prayers might prevail to join your hearts in love and amity. Oh, what a scandal it is to our crown that two such noble peers as ye should jar. Believe me, lords, my tender years can tell civil dissension is a viperous worm that gnaws the bowels of the commonwealth. He's not wrong because Ultimately, this civil dissension is going to ruin everything for all of them. Henry is emphasized as being, one, too young to really accomplish anything, and two, more interested in religion than in ruling. He believes in goodness and holiness, and that's nice, but he certainly isn't able to put anyone in their place. And as he's in the middle of saying this, all of Winchester's men and all of Gloucester's men are fighting in the street and chucking rocks at each other. Henry begs them to shake hands, which after some dallying they do. And then Richard Plantagenet steps up and requests his family lands back. He wants to be Duke of York again. And as we've noted, this is problematic because he is a threat to the throne, especially if given a little power. But Henry wants to make everybody happy and wants to have peace, and so he offers Richard back his land. So now, Richard Plantagenet is Richard Duke of York. And of course, Somerset is unhappy about this. The next several scenes are another big fight scene where Joan of Arc and her buddies take over Rouen. They sneak attack with some corn. But Talbot turns around and retakes Rouen, and uh, Old Bedford uh, is, watches the victory and then dies. Yay, those English heroes won't ever take any sort of French advance. Go, Talbot! At this point, Talbot goes to meet the king in Paris, Henry VI. And Burgundy is supposed to be following right behind him. But Joan steps up and with her silver tongue, talks Burgundy into defecting. Because Burgundy is actually French. He is alleged to the English, but he's been serving here in France. And she points out that as long as he keeps fighting here for the English, he's going to keep causing bloodshed for his home country. And he sees her point and decides to join her instead. Ah, betrayal! Henry VI finally gets to meet the great English hero Talbot and praises him, but there's tension in the wings because Richard, Duke of York, and the Duke of Somerset and all of their followers are fighting. They're arguing over whose rose is best. In the midst of this, there arrives a letter from Burgundy saying, Hey King, see you later, I'm defecting to the French, Bwahahaha. And Talbot is so angry, he says, let me rush out there and fight them. And the king says, yes. Go win, Talbot, you hero. And as Talbot, the symbol of heroism and unified England, marches off, in walk the 
followers of Somerset and York who are fighting over whose rose is best. They ask the king to be able to fight each other. And the king's like, that's stupid. And York and Somerset are like, no, it's not. We want to fight each other too. And Henry tries to make everything good for everybody. Come hither, you that would be combatants. Henceforth, I charge you, as you love our favor, quite to forget this quarrel and the cause. And you, my lords, remember where we are in France amongst a fickle, wavering nation. If they perceive dissension in our looks, and that within ourselves we disagree, how will their grudging stomachs be provoked to willful disobedience and rebel? So if we're gonna fight, obviously we're going to lose France. And then Henry does something really dumb. He says, it doesn't matter what color the rose is, in fact, I will wear a red rose. And of course that makes York angry. But at the same time, Henry says, and Richard, Duke of York, you can be my regent in France. He tries to smooth things over for everybody, giving everybody concessions. But all it does is add more tension and make everybody just a little bit more angry. And Richard, Duke of York, the fact that he took the red rose is so angry and he's ready to get back at the king. Uh-oh, Lord Talbot is standing before Bordeaux, basically ready to single-handedly fight the city. And he's like, I'm the English, you all are traitors, I'm ready to take over. And the general goes, ha 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 because there's all these huge armies of the French just surrounding. It's a trap! And Lord Talbot is completely surrounded by all of these French armies, thanks to Burgundy and Charles and Renier and Alcyon. But Talbot shrinks from no fight. He's ready to fight to the death if necessary, because he's a hero. Meanwhile, cut to York and Somerset, who are so busy arguing with each other that they can't be bothered to send any help to Talbot like they promised. When Sir William Lucy arrives, he's like, where's our help? Talbot's in trouble! York says, well, Somerset said he was gonna send me some horsemen, and he didn't, so I can't send you anything. And Somerset says, well, York just wanted to support Talbot for, in a stupid fight, so I'm not gonna send you anything. All this contrary to exactly what the king said when Henry said, uh, Richard, you take your foot soldiers, and Somerset, you take your horses, and combine them and send them to help. Nobody wants to help because they're too busy fighting with each other. And so the last half of Act 4 is this huge fight scene. It turns out that Talbot has one person show up to help him, and it's his son. And his son is actually showing up, like, to learn how to fight from his hero father. But it's a bad time because... Talbot's just about to face impossible odds and probably die. And so he tries to send his son home and says, you know, go home and live to fight another day. And his son's like, no, dad, if you won't turn from danger, I won't either. I'm going to prove my heroism too. And so we have, you know, the younger generation that might have been heroes, they all get sacrificed thanks to the stupid squabbling of York and Somerset. And Talbot and his son both get decimated. And in this really touching scene, Talbot dies holding the body of his son. The French obviously win this one. And when Sir Lucy arrives and says, are there any prisoners we would like to, you know, find out if Lord Talbot's okay? Joan points him out and says with a sneer, him that thou magnifiest with all these titles, stinking and fly about blown, lies here at our feet. <laughs> Joan, you're so evil! End of Act 4. Act 5 begins with Gloucester being like, you know what, we lost most of France. We probably should make peace with them while we can. And you know what, Henry, you can marry into the royal family. And if you do that, you'll be getting in again to the French family line and continuing these claims on the throne. You know, maybe something will happen in the future. And Henry's like, that's a good idea. And so he sends a pledge to this woman saying he'll marry her. Meanwhile, the Bishop of Winchester is now a cardinal, and he has been amassing power and wealth, and Gloucester is still fighting with him. Charles, the French Dauphin, finds out about the peace talks, and he decides to go to Paris and go ahead and give it a shot. Meanwhile, Joan is still fighting, but it seems like her power is waning. And in fact, in this moment, she summons demons to try to win for the French. Turns out she's not so good after all, maybe. She is a witch, like the English have been saying all along. And even though she offers up her body and her blood to these demons, they don't support her, and she loses. Richard, Duke of York, captures her and is set to burn her at the stake. And now she just sort of disintegrates as a character. Because at first she's like, but I'm so holy and pure, I'm so good. 
and her shepherd dad shows up and she's like, I don't know you, I'm royal. And when nothing seems to work and they're about to burn her, she starts running through every excuse she can to get out of being burned, including claiming that she's pregnant. And when they're like, we don't care if you have Charles' baby, you're gonna burn. And she's like, no, it's Alcyon's baby. I mean, no, it's Renier's baby. She keeps trying to find somebody whose baby they'll care about. Mm, doesn't work. Why does Joan disintegrate like this as a character? She was kind of potent at the beginning. Part of it is this big tension towards women in power. These plays are being written during the time that Queen Elizabeth is in power. And it's interesting that we have this sort of questioning of strong women. At first they seem like great assets, but then also there's the question, are they really monsters? Can we trust them? There's also probably the disintegration of Joan to prove the English right in the end, which is kind of important. If Joan is so holy, then the English are in the wrong, and we can't have that considering we're writing this from the English perspective. But although Joan is waning in power and is about to be executed and killed, we have another female figure that rises up. Again, a character that is going to entrance and create many power struggles, and that is Margaret. Now the Earl of Suffolk sees her and he's like, wow, I captured you, honey. But then he's like, no, wait, I'm married. And then he says, well, I can marry her to King Henry and then she'll be around. Except the problem is she's the daughter of Renier, which means that she has no money, no power. She's got nothing except her looks. And so Suffolk says, hey, Renier, I've got your daughter. Let's make an arrangement. I want to marry her to the king. And Renée is like, well, I'm not gonna give her any dowry and I want you to completely hand over my own property with no questions asked. And Suffolk's like, yeah, done, no problem. And so then Suffolk goes to Henry and even though Henry is already pledged to someone else, he wins Henry over being like, Margaret's the stuff, you gotta marry her. And all of Henry's lords are like, that's a terrible idea. That loses our connection to the throne, that uh, loses any sort of power you might've had. It's a bad match. But Suffolk argues that she's the daughter of a king, because Renier is king of Navarre, which comes with nothing. But Henry is won over, and so he wants her. And so Suffolk, as he finishes the play, comments that he is now going to use Margaret to take control of the king and the kingdom and be everything. Again, all the characters left standing are incredibly self-interested. And we see all the heroes are dead and sacrificed on the altar of individual self-interest. Where have all the heroes gone? And we also see all the threads that are going to lead into Henry VI Part Two, as we see the beginning of the War of Roses. These little squabbles that are just kind of fist fights in this one are gonna turn bloody next time. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another Shakespeare discussion. And I will see you next time as we look at Henry VI Part Two, the first part of the contention. Bye-bye.